Welcome to EM Cases Rapid Reviews, where we review the take-home points from the EM Cases main episode podcasts so you can ace your exams and take stellar care of your patients. Hi everyone, I'm Taryn from the EM Cases team, and this is a rapid review of episode 27 on drugs of abuse. This six-minute review is part one of the Drugs of Abuse podcast, and here we will cover two main points. First, we will cover the general approach to intoxicated patients in the ED. Then, we'll cover some pearls and pitfalls associated with toxicology. So, let's get started with the general approach. Like most approaches, here we also want to start with the ABCs, but this time I'm going to add ABC ECG. So first, A, airway. Start by examining the overall status of your patient, specifically in regards to their airway. Are they protecting it? Then move to breathing. How fast and labored is your patient breathing? Are they breathing? In toxicology, you can see all sorts. <laughs> in general, you can see all sorts. But toxins leading to metabolic acidosis can often cause high respiratory rates and increased work of breathing while something like an opioid can suppress respiratory drive altogether. Follow this by your usual circulation assessments and make an ECG a priority in all of these cases. Okay, so back to airway and breathing. If your patient required intubation for airway protection or ventilation, keep in mind what type of ingestion or exposure may be at play. You may wish to consider specific intubation medications, for example. If your patient is suspected of having been exposed to large quantities of organophosphates, you may want to think twice about using succinylcholine. Another pro tip. Think ahead for patients that you suspect toxins. Types of ingestions may progress to require intubation more quickly than you might expect. Also keep in mind their anticipated course and any need for aggressive cooling or paralysis. This would necessitate intubation earlier on in the game. All right, so you've done your airway and breathing assessment and you kept in mind all the extra considerations for a toxicology case. Now you've made it to the circulation component of your physical exam. Like for any patient, include an assessment of their perfusion, peripheral pulses, any ongoing bleeding, their blood pressure, and their heart rate. But please also include a temperature of every single patient and don't forget a skin assessment Specifically, you are looking for diaphoresis or particularly dry skin. Finally, you've made it to your ECG. ECGs are super important if you haven't gathered that from my points already. They can provide us tons of information around what type of toxin may be on board, and they also might provide clues of a patient that might be in serious danger if you don't pick up the signs. For example, your typical sodium channel blockade pattern can be seen on ECG and might suggest a TCA overdose. Or you can catch long QT intervals before torsades develops. Of course, we can also check for other things on the differential, like potential ischemia leading to altered level of consciousness or signs of metabolic abnormalities like hyperkalemia. Once you've gathered your information through your ABCs and ECGs, consider if this information falls into a specific toxidrome pattern Part two of this rapid review will cover the most common toxidromes, but for now, here are some items to consider for your physical exam to get you thinking like a toxicologist. First, temperature. Temperature matters and it matters right now. A temperature over 42 degrees Celsius leads to almost 100% mortality. Measure it and address it immediately. Do this through both active and passive cooling measures. Next, feel the skin. Is it dry, diaphoretic, and the temperature, is it hot or cold? You can also look for stigmata of drug use, such as track marks. The feel of the skin is important because, for example, the difference between dry skin and sweaty skin will make you consider an anticholinergic toxidrome over a sympathomimetic toxidrome. Next, check the pupil size and their response. Are they pinpoint? Consider an opioid. Dilated pupils might make you think of anticholinergic substances, on the other hand. Next, always remember to check a glucose. Make sure your altered patient isn't just hypoglycemic or in DKA. 
Awesome, so now you have your toxicology physical exam down pat. Next, I want to highlight some pearls and pitfalls relating to toxicology care in the emergency department. If you're going to order a serum ethanol level, be smart about it. Serum ethanol levels can be helpful to differentiate between different causes of altered mental status. Just remember that intoxicated patients can have other reasons to have a low level of consciousness. Also remember that if a patient you are believing is just intoxicated because they have a low GCS and then they go on to have a low blood ethanol level, you need to keep investigating. Also remember a single alcohol level cannot predict the clinical course of a patient. Ensure ongoing clinical reassessments and use the rest of your clinical history and management more than the single lab value. Okay, we work in the emergency department, not the police department. Urine screens are rarely helpful, at least in the initial acute management of these patients. It is not proof of intoxication, and there are plenty of false positives due to contaminants and cross-reactivity of the test. Consider ordering it in your first-time seizures, patients that will go on to be admitted to hospital, and if you have a case of suspected child abuse. Speaking of seizures, if you have a patient that presents with seizure and you suspect it's from a toxin or a drug, keep in mind that your usual seizure medications will not be as effective. Seizures because of toxins are not due to sodium channel blockade, but are usually due to GABA channel blockade. This means your benzos and your phenytoin are not as useful. Progress to phenobarbital and propofol sooner. And if you do use benzos, use a larger dose. Use diazepam one milligram per kilogram. Oh, and one more note. Avoid haloperidol for agitation in any patient that might have a toxin or drug on board. It can lower their seizure threshold. All right, we made it. In summary today, we covered the general approach to any patient that may have toxicology on their differential. Don't forget to try and identify a toxidrome and don't forget to order those ECGs. Second, I hope the extra toxicology pearls will be helpful. Keep them in the back of your mind throughout your next shift. For full references and the written summaries on drugs of abuse, please go to www.emergencymedicinecases.com.